Assalamu alaikum. I am uh, Professor Khalid Khan. I am uh, based in the University of Granada in Spain. And I'm most grateful to have the opportunity to present a lecture at uh, your Congress. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about what is responsible medical research publication. Well, first, I'd like to give you a little bit of my own uh, personal history. I commenced uh, medical school in 1983 in Karachi. Uh, I then worked for some time in Kenya, returned to Pakistan where I completed my fellowship from uh, our College of Physicians and Surgeons. And uh, Subsequently, I trained in uh, epidemiology at McMaster University, from where I moved to the United Kingdom and lived there for nearly 25 years. During this time, I had the opportunity to work as a professor at universities in Birmingham and in London. And, uh, Around five years ago, I took the opportunity to move to the University of Granada, where I am based. During my journey, I had my first paper accepted for publication in 1990, and uh, subsequently had my first systematic review published in 1995. And my career in the UK took me through various stages, including working as a full-time consultant in the National Health Service, as well as subsequently as a full-time academic in the university setting, uh, where I had the opportunity to write various books and edit uh, various journals. During my role as research director, I had the opportunity to oversee large number of studies during their conduct. And uh, inevitably, it also presented me with, uh, uh, with the duty to investigate uh, complaints on some occasions. Uh, but really, my experience as editor particularly as chief editor of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, through the oversight of over 10,000 manuscripts under my leadership, gave me the chance to observe closely how research publication should take place and that how it should take place with integrity. And... Uh, I've had the opportunity to make presentations of the kind you are viewing just now in over 39 countries in the various uh, inhabited continents uh, of this world. So I speak to you with uh, relevant uh, training and experience. My two books that contribute directly to my presentation today are shown here in this slide. Uh, the first one refers to systematic reviews, which uh, evaluates published literature. And the other one refers to publication of randomized controlled trials with integrity, which talks directly about how to transparently conduct and report clinical trials. So what is all this about? Well, in the end, the idea behind research is to combine the art we learn from uh, experience and put it together with uh, the science that we read in journals. And the published articles combined with this experience uh, can be called evidence-based medicine. The journals curate the E of evidence-based medicine and they typically present papers in this structure with title abstract, etc. The initial assessment made by editors and readers alike focus on title abstract and introduction. Uh, 
but also on figures and tables. Uh, but I think from the point of view of modern publishing, the last point listed here, the appendices, which introduce transparency in publication become important. When we talk about getting research published, we imagine this cycle where a submitted paper is peer reviewed, revised, possibly rejected, then resubmitted, and uh, is ultimately accepted for publication. We aim to make a good impression through the title abstract introduction and a lasting impression through the discussion and the conclusion. Now, here is a, a story for you published by the Stanford Daily, which refers to the retraction of paper by uh, the head of the Stanford University. Uh, this happened towards the end of last year, and a complaint was made concerning the paper long time ago, nearly 10 years prior to its retraction. And it took all this time and repeat complaints for the matter to be investigated and then for ultimately for the papers to be retracted. And this obviously had ripple effect and consequences for the authors of the paper who subsequent to the retraction had to basically leave his post um, in, in, in the interest of, uh, of science. Retraction is not a phenomenon unique to the Stanford University or the United States, but retraction is common worldwide, including here uh, our own country, Pakistan. What is responsible research conduct? Well, it contains at least three elements moral values, which relate to ethics, professional standards, which relate to the conduct of research uh, in accordance with the, with the prevalent rules, and research culture, which refers both to the institutions where research takes place, but also to the culture within journals and the peer review system uh, which evaluates the paper after completion of research and leads to its publication in its uh, scientific final form. With responsible research conduct in all the three avenues, there is a possibility that the studies undertaken have appropriate approvals and uh, adequate conduct and analysis with respect to professional standards. And finally, with publication standards met, is reported in a transparent manner. However, if there are some problems, there is potentially, at the one end, clearly irresponsible conduct, and at the other end, clearly by the book, responsible conduct. And in between, there is a gray zone where discussion and consultation with colleagues is required. There is a possibility that errors take place. It is often said that all studies can be done better after they are completed. Uh, if the errors are honest and transparently reported, there isn't that much of a problem. The problem arises when the errors introduced in publications are intentional. So if complaints are raised and investigations are carried out, there may be no case to answer in the case of an honest error. Or, but in case of genuine errors, papers may be retracted. Or people may suffer consequences in light of uh, misconduct uh, allegations being found. But there remains a body of literature where no complaints are made, no investigations are undertaken, and the literature remains in its published form available to 
readers. Now, what is a journal? Journal is enters the scientific uh, publication scene after the research is completed. An owner of the journal appoints some staff and a chief editor. It also appoints a publisher. The chief editor then assembles a team made up of editors, editorial board, and a set of peer reviewers who hopefully follow the various um, instructions that exist in uh, the guidance, such as the World Association of uh, Medical Editors guidance. And using these guidance documents, a journal has a strategy according to which it evaluates submission through peer review and its own editorial assessment. A proportion of papers are rejected and the remaining paper that are accepted form the content of the journal. Here we see the website of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors and the Committee of uh, Publication Ethics. It's important to highlight that these are self-regulatory bodies. They don't have any formal, official or real legal role in the oversight of the publication process. So let's uh, have a look at a journal where I was chief editor, the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. You can see that there is a large number of staff involved in assessing the around 1,600 or so papers that we received at the time. The number has now gone up over 2,000. Each journal has a responsibility to deliver its own task well, but also to offer opportunities for training to others who want to uh, develop themselves as uh, academics in this field. Please note that, uh, you, that from your own experience, you'll probably not come as a surprise that medical training does not offer any form of um, instruction in medical editing. Uh, so self-learning, or nowadays through attending formal courses, one can, uh, uh, one can acquire the expertise required. And uh, hopefully the lecture of the kind that I'm delivering now will contribute uh, towards uh, the training event that you are organizing today. Now, peer review is a key element of assessment of the papers submitted. Having said that, peer review is known to be broken. We know it is broken because a very large number of papers are being retracted on an annual basis. For example, hundreds of papers have been retracted in the last year. Even many journals have been closed down simply because their assessment and peer reviewer system did not work. And they published a large number of papers that were subsequently found to have some serious integrity flow and the papers were retracted. There are many reasons why people enter the system of publication and perform the task of peer reviewers. Probably the most important reason is that uh, they want to make a contribution towards how publications take place. They may have an interest in detecting fraud in research um, but the most important reason, I believe, is that academic progress uh, requires playing a role in the publication system. And therefore, people want to take up the role of peer reviewer and editor, not necessarily with competence in the tasks required for the job, but more with good faith and in the hope that after joining the system, they will acquire the skills required. This is what, this is what I went through in my own life uh, with now over 25 years of experience as an editor and peer reviewer. Here is a list of reasons uh, people have highlighted why they want to take up peer review and editorship. The people who are editors are not robots. They are human beings and their opinions are scientific as well as personal. Uh, 
both readers and journal editors themselves need to be aware of the potential biases and conflicts that uh, affect the process of, uh, of, of uh, responsible, sometimes irresponsible, uh, peer review, edit, editorial assessment, and publication. So in general, it is said that uh, peer review can be improved, for example, by making the peer reviewers blind to who has submitted. This task is difficult. Um, but peer reviewers tend to enjoy anonymity so that authors who submit papers tend not to know the identity of the peer reviewers. I believe this single blind process of peer review is unfair and gives undue power to reviewers and editors over authors. Double blinding is virtually impossible. I am proposing here to you to consider open peer review whereby the identity of peer reviewers and their reports are available to not only the authors but to the public because this truly has the chance to make the publication process um, transparent and open. And uh, this is where the world is moving towards transparency. Publication need to move in the same direction. The typical questions that editors and peer reviewers ask in the paper assessment process are these. Is the paper new? Is it true? Does it matter? Can it be improved? The most important element here, in my view, is whether the study is true, i.e., it has integrity. It does not have a flaw that fundamentally makes the results um, untrue or unbelievable. And to achieve this, we are moving towards uh, an approach that uses various checklists and encourages openness and transparency. And the checklist can be found in websites like the Equator Network, which I show you here, and the uh, Committee of Medical Journal Editors recommends things such as trial registration ahead of patient recruitment in a form that is public, to permit for transparency uh, to be incorporated in the process of publication. And this is because we don't want that the material submitted is uh, manipulated in its analysis or its reporting through the benefit of hindsight that we are addressing hypothesis prospectively generated and evaluated. In the same time, there is a greater emphasis that patient and public should be involved in the process of science, not merely as human subjects taking part in studies, but as co-investigators so that the act of undertaking scientific projects and their publication is an act of co-production where scientists engage patients as equal partners in the undertaking of the research work. And this can happen through inclusion, for example, of lay members in trial steering committees, uh, but also as uh, co-authors along with uh, research, uh, uh, along with trialists in the, in the undertaking, in the planning of the trial. But peer review also is moving towards assessment of papers by lay readers. And uh, I hope in time in Pakistan, we will also be able to incorporate uh, lay input into the peer review process. Now, we refer to this cycle of submission, peer review, assessment, rejection, resubmission, revision, finally acceptance. Integrity concerns can arise at any stage during peer review or post-publication. It's well known, established through various studies that uh, around 10 to 15% of scientists themselves accept that either they or their colleagues 
they know have engaged in uh, in uh, in in questionable research practice practices and to be polite not to say uh, research misconduct that is deliberate now when the prevalence of concerns about misconduct are at such a high level of percentage the onus lies on journals to make an effort to ensure that such potentially flawed material sometimes may be blatantly fraudulent but potentially flawed material that may be the result of for example inadequate training or an honest a truly honest error does not go forward and become available in the public domain whereby it has the potential then to be included in guidelines and practice and we only have to think about what happened with respect to the use of anti malarials in the covid era where subsequent to investigation undertaken properly some studies were retracted and those studies that were with integrity when combined in meta analysis demonstrated that anti malarials actually increased mortality not that they were helping patients but they were actually being actively being harmful to people who use these medications uh, potentially recommended through flawed research so there is a tendency towards using checklists for assessing integrity and with time these checklists are going on are, are going towards uh, the provision of application of these checklists through automated mechanisms for example nowadays we perform just as we perform plagiarism checks through automation so automated software will be able to check for example through evaluation of the baseline tables reported where randomization has taken place properly so coming towards the end as a manuscript moves from submission to editorial assessment possible possible rejection or request for resubmission with more information and then through peer review and further editorial assessment and possibly through rejection or request for resubmission with uh, further information the aim of this process would be to bring out an element of transparency through which the confidence in the published material can be increased compared to the current situation where doubt about integrity of published material is being talked about on a daily basis uh, not only in the academic social media but also in the general newspapers uh, and and even in the broadcast uh, uh, news and the way to achieve this is through prospective registration through public sharing of the statistical analysis plan well ahead of completion of the study data sharing at the time of publication this is where journals become important they ensure that registered studies are given priority uh, and that at the time of publication data can be shared responsibly and they obtain transparency declarations from authors and authenticity certification from uh, institutional bodies such as the ethics committee uh, where or where an institution gave approval for the conduct of a study in its uh, <clears throat> in its workplace and that peer review and editorial system should ensure that the reported material is in accordance with the registered and planned analysis of the project being undertaken it's only with this that we can move towards a situation where confidence is increased uh, compared to the current situation where the confidence is falling in science and in scientists and in editors one of the way going forward given that there is so much doubt about 
the editorial peer review process and uh, the value it brings to publication is that funders are asking researchers to move towards publication of preprints with transparency and journals such as uh, F1000 listed here as one example of many that exist are moving towards transparent and collaborative peer review. Now the peer review no longer remains um, uh, something that happens behind a wall of anonymity and reprimands authors, but instead becomes a partner with authors in producing publication that are as transparent and as free of integrity flaws as possible. And then through this mechanism, there is a possibility of post-publication peer review so that there is always a possibility that even a published paper which has a version, uh, the final version available can be amended and improved as time goes by. So with this summary, I bring my presentation to close demonstrating here an article uh, which has now taken some time, but it is going through peer review. Its preprint version is still available and uh, at some stage it will become a final version. Perhaps in the future there will be no such thing as a final version. There will always be the possibility of improvement and amendment to a final version depending on how uh, the readers evaluate the published work. So, to summarize, responsible medical research publication is a process that is coming under strong scrutiny. Uh, I think editors and those responsible for ethical medical publishing uh, ought to move towards full transparency or to get rid of the one-sided peer review process and start introducing uh, open peer review with complete uh, peer review reports being available and finally making it possible for uh, readers to give feedback to authors so that there remains open the possibility of uh, revision and improvement even in the final published form of the paper. Uh, with this uh, conclusion, I would like to thank you once again uh, for listening to me.